Okay, let's start out on the left here. We're asked to solve this one for P, which means we're getting P by itself there. So we have to get rid of the 4. It's actually a negative 4 that multiplies the P. And we have to get rid of the 8F that's being added to the P. Which one do we get rid of first? <clears throat> Subtract the 8F. Very good. So the 8F is gone. We just have negative 4P equals... <coughs> 2 cubed. Minus 8F. There's nothing we can combine there, so we just put them together like that. <clears throat> then what? Divide by negative 4. So negative 4 is gone. P equals 2Q divided by negative 4. There's a negative 2 over 4, a negative 1 over 2, Q. Negative 8F divided by negative 4 is a positive 2F. <clears throat> so that's what that turns out to be. Any questions on that one? <coughs> Up to the right side here on top, how do we graph that first one? Well, to graph it, we have to have it in y equals. What's keeping y from being alone? The 3. How is it attached to the y? It is multiplied, so to get rid of it, we will... 3. So y equals, what's 2x divided by 3? 2 thirds x. Negative 3 divided by 3? <clears throat> Minus 1. So now, where do we start to graph it? Negative 1. And from there we go up 2 over 3. Perfect. This next one down here, we have to get y alone still. What do we have? Where do we start? Subtract 3x. So 2y equals 20 minus 3x. Then what? <clears throat> Divide by 2. So y equals 20 divided by 2 is 10, and then negative 3x minus 2 is negative 3 over 2x. So there you go. So where do we start? On the graph, we're going to start it. 10, right? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And from there we're going to go <clears throat> down 3 over 2, right? 1, 2, 3 over 1, 2. 1, 2, 3 over 1, 2. And we can keep going with the slope like that if we want to, if we want to try to make it more accurate. If I could draw that line, it would look prettier than that. You get the picture, right? Okay. This graph is actually something we're going to use and before the hour is over, we're going to come back to doing more graphing. But in the last half hour or so on Friday, I gave you guys a packet to work on. It's at units 38, 41, and 42 had different equations that you were using. <clears throat> Looking through this packet, it talked about spur gears and other formulas and stuff like that. I want to concentrate on section 38 right now. Where I had formulas for tapers and all sorts of good things. Like... <clears throat> oh, I don't know. Um, page 223 in the packet. Yep, let me grab that for you. So they got formulas on pulleys that they're using here, number 48 and 51 there. Actually, just number 51 is what we're going to look at. 
And their first <coughs> formula they're looking at is just the length of a belt to go around pulleys. And they're giving us the formula L is 3.14 times 0.5 big D plus 0.5 little d plus 2x. <clears throat> now this is just an approximation. There are other adjustments that can be made. X is the distance between center to center from the pulleys. Big D is the diameter of the big pulley. Little D is the diameter of the little pulley. This is put in this form so it's easier to solve for D or little D or big D if we had to. <coughs> so let's say we were asked to solve this for X, which would be the simplest one to solve for. If I wanted to solve this for X, what would I have to do? Parentheses first, yeah. Really, no matter what I'm solving for here, the first step is going to be the same. I've got to do something with those parentheses. There's nothing to do in the parentheses, but there is something that needs to be done to the parentheses, and that's times the 3.14. So 3.14 times 0.5D is 1.57 big D. 3.14 times 0.5 little d is 1.57 little d. Now we don't have any parentheses to worry about. Now we can worry about solving for x over here. So I am going to subtract the 1.57 big D and 1.57 little d. Now I put them in parentheses like that so I can subtract them both at once. I could have subtracted them both separately if I had cared to do it that way. Why aren't you erasing? I could have just subtracted them both in pieces like that either way. Um, might make more sense to subtract them both separately like this. Because on the other side, what we're going to end up with is L minus 1.57 capital D minus 1.57 little d. And now, of course, we have to divide by 2. So we've got L over 2 minus 1.57 divided by 2 is point what? Point seven eight five. Big D minus 0.785 little d equals x. So we've solved for x. And once we have it in this form right here, solving for big D or little d is pretty much the same thing. Subtract and then divide. Um, Today what we want to concentrate on is less solving for one of the variables now and actually using the formulas. You know, for example, um, I said this was a simplified formula that I gave here, but if I wanted to actually find the length of a belt from given information like that, make sure I have the right version in front of me here. There are all sorts of formulas that we can look at. Um, <coughs> the main one I would use is this. Either use pi or just 3.14, big D plus little d, over 2 plus 2x. That's the main formula that we've seen. So let's say little d is 6 inches, big D is 10 inches, and x is 21 inches. In your notes, find the length of that belt quick. Okay, so... Here, we're going to put in 
10 for big D, 6 for little d, and then 2 times 21. So we do have to do the, the 10 plus 6 is 16. 3.14 times 16 is 50.24. Divided by 2 is 25.12. 2 times 21 is 42. So I am actually getting 67.12. I'm thinking you might have forgot to divide by 2 there. So 67.12 inches, so it's either a 67 or 68 inch belt, depending on how it's measured. Another big one is taper. <coughs> this will be a big one for you guys if you're doing a tapered shaft. In fact, tapers are big enough in machining and mechanical design that they actually define it called Morris tapers. Uh, Morris tapers are standard tapers that just, you know, a number three Morris taper is a certain inches per foot of diameter. It's like 0. 0.623 something inches per foot. There might be. I'm, just, I'm familiar with the Morris tapers. And it's not Morris, it's Morse, right? Morse code. So let's say that this is one and one eighth inch on the large end and three fourths inch on the small end. And we have a 10 inch length. <coughs> Taper is always defined as inches of diameter per foot of length. <coughs> So the taper, T, is big D minus little d over L divided by 12, where all measurements, D, both Ds and L, are in inches. So this would be 1 and an 8 minus 3 fourths over 10 divided by 12. <clears throat> 1 and 1 eighth minus 3 fourths is 3 eighths. 10 divided by 12, I'm just going to make that 10 twelfths and reduce it to 5 6. So now I have 3 eighths divided by 5 6, which is going to become 3 eighths times 6 fifths. And I'll cross cancel the 8 and 6, both divide by 2 to give me 3 and 4. 3 times 3 is 9, 4 times 5 is 20. So the taper here is 9 twentieths of an inch per foot. So for every foot of length, the diameter will change by 9 twentieths of an inch, or by 0.45 inches for every foot of length. So I think that's pretty much it. The rest is just evaluating formulas. Um, Jess, have any questions out of this packet as you're going through it? Not really? So ready for a quiz? Oh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, did, I just went over the two main formulas. Any other formulas you'd need would be in the, the or on the quiz. Okay, there's a couple of you still working on the quiz, and that's fine. Feel free to take as much time as you need to finish up. I want to take a little bit of time right now and just take a peek at what comes next. So, we've graphed things that look like this. And when we graph that, what did it look like on the graph? Where did we start? Negative 1, and from there we went up 2 over 3. Very good. And there's our graph. What does that blue line represent? Yes, yeah, the graph of that equation, but what does it really represent? Is a function. What's that? There you go. Every point on that line. 
is a solution to this equation. If I pick a point right here, let's say that's where x equals 5, and I trace it this way well, as well, that would be where y equals 2 and 1 third. If I put that in for x and y, it makes that equation true. Every point on that line is a solution to that equation. So now let's say I have another equation. It looks like that. So now this one I start at 5. And from there I go down 1 over 2. Down 1 over 2. Down 1 over 2. And I end up I'm not necessarily no. That's not at 5. Um, anyway, what's that green line represent? Yeah, that's all the points that are solutions to that green equation. What we're going to start talking about today and for most of the rest of the semester is systems of equations. When we have a single equation, and we're just talking about linear equations. We're not going to do parabolas and other types of equations for systems of equations. But you could. In engineering, you would do that. Um, each single equation has an infinite number of solutions. Every point on that line is a solution to it. A system of equations, what we are looking for is we're looking for two or more equations, and we're trying to find the point that is a solution to both or all of the equations at the same time. Well, where on this graph is there a point that's a solution to both of these equations at the same time? Where they intersect, where they cross, right there. If we were to figure that out, it would be at 6, 3, or 6, 2, something like that. It, it's going to be out there. So Actually, it's not right at 6. It's somewhere in between. Um, but you can see where they cross is going to be the one spot that's a solution to both equations. Now there are, when we're dealing with two linear equations, there are three distinct possibilities. The first possibility is like we have there. We have two lines that intersect that have one solution where they intersect. But there are two other possibilities. I mean, that's the obvious possibility. There are two other possibilities. We could have two lines that end up being parallel. How many solutions would there be? None. No solutions. The third possibility is the one that most people overlook. They're parallel, but not only are they parallel, they are on top of each other. They are the same line. In that case, there's an infinite number of solutions. But people mess this one up. They say that any number is a solution. That's not true. That is not a solution over there. What it is is any number that's on one of the equations, one of the lines, is, a, is also on the other line. So the solution is either one of the lines or both of the lines. But anything that's a solution to one line is, a, is also on the other line. So let's take a look at a couple of examples here. Let's do y equals negative one-half x plus, oh, let's go plus four, and y equals two x minus one. So for the first equation, we're going to start at positive four, and from there we're going to go down 1 over 2, correct? And again, if we wanted to be accurate, we could keep going down 1 over 2, down 1 over 2, down 1 over 2, and plot it out that way. This equation we start at negative 1, and we go up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1. 
And we can see where they cross. That point is 2, comma, 3. Now you can see the weaknesses of this. Here, that came out to be an exact coordinate point, a grid point on our graph, 2, 3. But even that was kind of tough to do. We had to be very, very careful in our graphing to find that point. If it's a fraction or a decimal, it's almost impossible to find the answer by graphing. And, of course, both of these equations were in graphing form. We can end up with equations that look like this. I just got to make sure I make this work out well. So let's see here. Something like that. We're going to graph those two equations. Obviously, both of them need a little bit of work before they can be graphed. So, this top one, what do we have to do? So, we have to subtract the 2x first. <coughs> so, we have negative 3y equals 6 minus 2x, and then divide by negative 3. So y equals negative 2 plus 2 thirds x. So we start at negative 2, we go up to over 3. We get that line. Is this one going to work out the way I want it to? No, it's not. I'm going to alter that one just a touch, just because I'm cheating. Minus 6 is what I want it to be. There, I'm done cheating for now. Okay, so now to solve this one, we're going to subtract the 2x. Some days making up the problems on the spot works really well. Some days it don't work worth a darn. Apparently this morning the little hamster is still in bed. So, now we got negative y equals negative 6 minus 2x. We treat that as a negative 1y and we divide by a negative 1. So y equals 6 plus 2x. It still didn't work. But that's okay. That should have been a positive 6. So I'd make that a negative 6 plus 2x. Now it'll work. So we start out at negative 6. And we go up 2 over 1. Up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1. And we get our that point. So my uh, crappy problem-making skills this morning aside, you can see you've got to be very careful. Notice I just didn't go up 2 over 1 and try to draw the line through them. I kept going with my slope up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1, until they crossed and I found that point in common. Now, if you guys have grid paper, um, that will be great. If not... I can see if I have some graph paper somewhere I can photocopy for you. Um, yes, sir. That's what we're going to do tomorrow. That, what Russell brought up is, well, why don't we just solve them algebraically so we don't have to put them on the graph and be so... Uh, so precise about it. And that's what we're going to do tomorrow. There are algebraic ways of calculating the answer rather than just graphing the answer. And there are two methods we're going to look at tomorrow. And then after Thanksgiving, there's a method we're going to look at as well. Um, hopefully, we're going to try to get our Unit 3 test done before you leave for Thanksgiving. Um, chances are we'll probably start it in class on Friday, then I'll let you take it home over break. Um, no, that's not me being a nice guy. That's my way of saying I want your vacation, too. But, uh, <laughs> there's just no way. It, it, it's a long test. There's no way we'd get it done in a one-hour class. Even though we have two hours on Friday, we're probably going to need the first hour to review and go over stuff anyway. Um, we do have a couple of quizzes. There is a quiz coming up. 
Uh, tomorrow there will probably be a quiz on this graphing to solve equations, and then probably Thursday or so there will be a quiz on um, our other methods that we talked about, either Thursday or maybe in the first hour on Friday, depending on how things go. But then we do have our, our unit test coming up, probably over break. After break, then, we'll come back and we'll talk more about these systems of equations. Just because we do our test doesn't mean we're done. But what I usually do is I have the two variable, x and y, equations on in the unit, so it's on the unit test. And then we'll come back and we'll spend a week or maybe a little more talking about free variable systems of equations. And then we'll, we'll talk about some applications of systems of equations. For you guys, um, what's that? X, Y, Z, yep. X, Y, Z coordinates. And also for you guys, there's a lot of applications on the material side. Um, now that you're a one-year program, you guys don't do the material science anymore, but there's some metallurgy applications that we can talk about where systems of equations uh, help you define temperatures and mixtures of solids and stuff like that in your alloys. So we'll look at some of that. For tonight, for today, in the big book, page 409, it is exercise 17-1. 1 through 17, the odds. Now again, these take a while to do, so I don't expect you to do all nine of the odds there. Do the first, you know, do like every other one, and if you're struggling, go back and do some more. But be aware that there is a quiz coming up on graphing systems of equations at some point in the next day or two.